Welcome back to another episode of the Bible Vlog. Today we are starting in Mark chapter 15 and we are almost through the entire Gospel of Mark. We have one more chapter to go after this, but this is definitely one of the most fascinating chapters in the whole book of Mark. When you talk about the crucifixion of Jesus, obviously in, in, in one hand when we read about the torture and the, and the absolute agony that Jesus went through, it's horrifying in one way to read about. But at the same time we're reminded of the sense of hope and what was to come from Jesus' sacrifice on the cross. Without Jesus doing what he did in Mark 15, nothing else matters. So we start in chapter 15 and we can see already that Jesus has been up all night being tormented, tortured, hit, spit upon, mocked, all of these things by the Sanhedrin. But here's the one problem. The religious leaders, the scribes, the Pharisees, all these people who hate Jesus cannot sentence him to death. Even though they found him guilty of blasphemy, all capital punishment has to be carried out by Rome because the Jewish people were underneath Roman rule at this time. What the religious leaders have to do is they have to bring Jesus to Pilate, who was the Roman governor of that region at the time, and accuse him of not blasphemy blasphemy, even though that was what they were really upset about, they have to twist Jesus' words and convince Pilate that Jesus is setting himself up as a king in rebellion against Rome. Basically, they're trying to paint Jesus as a traitor and convince Pilate that this is what his intentions were. So starting in verse 2, we can see Pilate himself is almost curious about this position of Jesus. He's having a hard time finding anything guilty about Jesus as he's speaking to him. So look at verse 2. Then Pilate asked Jesus, Are you the king of the Jews? Jesus answered and said to him, It is as you say. You see, Jesus wouldn't defend himself. In spite of the Sanhedrin taking him in the middle of the night, in spite of all the false witnesses and the false stories and people accusing him of things that he never even said, he sits there and is silent because he knows what he has to do. In verse 3, the chief priest accused him of many things, but he answered nothing. Then Pilate asked him again, saying, Do you answer nothing? See how many things they testify against you. But Jesus still answered nothing, and Pilate marveled. Now listen, from reading Pilate's response here, I have no doubt that this was the only time Pilate had ever seen a man accused this close to being sentenced to death, and he says nothing in his own defense. This was mind-blowing to Pilate. Why would you not speak up when people are about to crucify you? Wouldn't you say something? And if if anybody had anything to say, it would have been Jesus. He has wisdom. He's innocent. He's done nothing wrong. He could walk right out of the situation, but he chooses not to. He remains silent. Now, while all of this is happening, it's during the time of the feast for the Jewish people, and as was a customary tradition once a year, Pilate, or whoever was the governor at that time, would release one of the Jewish prisoners back to the people. So Pilate comes out and he says, do you want me to release to you the king of the Jews, talking about Jesus? And part of the reason Pilate phrased it that way was just to annoy the Jewish leaders because he could tell they were envious of him. But in verse 11, it says that the chief priest had stirred up the crowd to encourage them to release Barabbas to them instead of Jesus. Barabbas was in prison in addition to other guys for leading a rebellion against Rome and he was actually guilty of murdering people. Most likely Barabbas was part of a group known as the Zealots, which was part of a radical group of the Jewish people who was known for leading rebellions against Rome. They hated being underneath Roman rule and the Zealots hated it more than anybody. So Pilate is standing on the stage with Jesus on one hand and Barabbas on another and the crowd starts chanting, give us Barabbas. So Pilate spoke up again in verse 12 and says, what do you want me to do with Jesus? And the crowd starts shouting, crucify him. And again, we see Pilate struggling here. He can't find any guilt with Jesus in verse 14. He says, why? What evil has he done? But they cried out all the more, crucify him. So Pilate, wanting to gratify the crowd, released Barabbas to them, and he delivered Jesus over to be scourged and to be crucified. You see, at the end of the day, Pilate just thought, this isn't my problem. In fact, in other parts of the Gospels, we read about Pilate washing his hands of Jesus, saying, I'm innocent of this man's blood. But he wasn't. And ultimately, Jesus knew this was going to happen. But in every stage of Jesus going to the crucifixion, we see over and over again his innocence on full display. Before the soldiers lead Jesus out to be crucified, it says that they took him to a hall and brought in the whole garrison. In verse 17, it says that they put a purple robe on him to mock him. It says that they made a crown of thorns and shoved it down on his head until it started bleeding. They mocked him. They hit him over the head with a reed. They spit on him. And then they get down on their knees, making fun of him, saying, Hail, King of the Jews. Finally, after they've had their fill of mockery, mocking Jesus, they lead him outside to be crucified. Now, most men condemned to death by crucifixion were forced to carry a beam of their own cross, usually a great distance to where they were to be crucified. From historic accounts, these beams usually weighed anywhere from 30 to 40 pounds, which may not sound like a lot to carry. When you're walking several miles already in a weakened state and uphill, which was Jesus' case, he could no longer bear the burden. It says that he collapsed underneath the weight of the cross and that they compelled a certain man named Simon to carry Jesus' cross for him. Finally, they arrive at Golgotha, which means place 
of a skull, which is where Jesus is to be crucified. It says that they nailed him to the cross and then put an inscription above him that said, the King of the Jews. Now, an inscription above the cross was customary for men in that day. It usually laid out the crimes that they were guilty of, which had led to their crucifixion. Often they would carry this sign in addition to the cross on their back as they approached where they were to be crucified. In verse 27, we read that two robbers were also crucified with Jesus, one on his left and one on his right, which actually fulfilled another prophecy in Isaiah 53 that he would be numbered among the transgressors. And while Jesus is agonizing on the cross, people are walking by mocking him. If you're so powerful, why don't you save yourself? You saved others, why can't you come down off the cross? If you're really the Messiah, if you're really the Son of God like you claim, save yourself. Now here's the crazy thing. Jesus could have done that. Listen, a lot of people think Jesus was just hanging there because he was forced to. No, 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 no. At any moment, he could have come down off of that cross. At any moment, he could have just said, stop. That's it. I've had enough. Every angel in heaven would have annihilated the entire Roman Empire. All Jesus had to do was utter a word and everything was over. Everything would have ended. But he didn't do it. It was love that held him to that cross. You see, Jesus knew while he was hanging there, if he didn't go through with this, if he didn't complete his mission, man could not come back into right standing with God. His sacrifice is what the entire rest of the New Testament pivots on. Without Jesus dying on the cross, the entire rest of the gospel is for nothing. Now, verses 33 through 41 show us some fascinating stuff happening at the crucifixion scene. Now, when the sixth hour had come, which was actually noon, there was darkness over the whole land for the next three hours until the ninth hour, which was three o'clock. Now, think about this. It's the middle of the day, and as Jesus is dying on this cross, all of a sudden there's darkness over the whole land. Everybody watching this has to recognize that this is unusual. In verse 34, at the ninth hour, Jesus cried out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Now listen, a lot of people didn't understand what was happening in this moment. In this moment, Jesus is literally taking on the entire sin of the world. Think about every single sin that you have ever committed. Now think about everybody in the world from the past and into the future. Jesus took all of that sin on himself. It's so hideous, it's so awful, it's so wrong that God himself has to turn away from Jesus because he cannot look at him with that much sin on him. Jesus in this moment is 100% alone. He is by himself, not even God the Father is with him in this moment. Finally, in verse 37, it says that Jesus cried out with a loud voice and breathed his last. Now look at verse 38. Then the veil of the temple was torn into from top to bottom. Now this is amazing. If there was no other sign given, this should have been enough for the people at that time. To give you an idea, this temple veil that they were referring to was 60 feet high, 30 feet wide, and four inches thick. It was thicker than most phone books, and it was ripped in half from top to bottom. Not bottom to top, top to bottom. Literally, the Holy of Holies ripped open. I have no doubt there were high priests who were in the temple ministering that day who were shocked out of their minds to see the temple veil ripped in half as they were inside. What this literally meant is that God's presence is now available to everybody. No longer were animal sacrifices needed. The ultimate sacrifice, Jesus, God's Son Himself, gave His life so that we now have access to the Father. It's amazing. What Jesus did is He gave us complete access that did not exist before. And this is the beauty of what Jesus did. Was it agonizing? Was it barbaric and horrible to have Jesus go through this? Absolutely. But what he did was such an act of grace and beauty and love that I cannot put words into it. Now imagine being there that day. You're seeing darkness cover the land in the middle of the day. Jesus dies on the cross. The temple veil is torn from top to bottom in half, which should be impossible. And look at what this Roman centurion, who most likely didn't even believe in God, says in verse 39, truly this man was the Son of God. I believe there were a number of people there that day who saw the circumstances and saw what Jesus did, who had no other explanation but to sit there and say, he had to be the Son of God. Now after Jesus dies, we read about a man named Joseph of Arimathea who goes to Pilate and asks for Jesus' body so that he can bury it properly. Now this was unusual because most of the time when someone was crucified, especially for a reason like high treason, which is what Jesus was accused of, they simply left the remains unburied. Many times they would just toss the body out into a field because it was considered dishonorable. So for Joseph to come and offer to bury Jesus' body inside of a nice tomb is something that caught everybody off guard. So Pilate grants Joseph permission to take the body of Jesus and in verse Verse 46, it says, Then he brought fine linen and took Jesus down and wrapped him in the linen. He laid him in a tomb and rolled a rock against the door of the tomb. And this is the setup for the greatest event in human history, the resurrection of Jesus Christ.
Guys, that is it for today with chapter 15. Listen, we have one last chapter to go and we started on Monday in Mark 16. Do not miss the resurrection of Jesus. It's what the entire gospel of Mark leads up to is this moment when Jesus comes back to life. Guys, as always, thank you for watching. I hope you're enjoying this as much as I am. We'll see you back here on Monday for Mark chapter 16.